أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. We've been discussing the wives of the Prophet and we've been examining the the contentious topic of whether or not Ayatul Tathir, the verse of purification, includes the wives of the Prophet. We spoke a little bit about the contextual clues within the Quran which support the exclusion of the wives. We looked at the, the verses before Ayatul Tathir, we looked at the verses after it, and we went through some of the, the linguistic arguments, and we looked primarily at what the Qur'an itself tells us. So we looked at the context of the verses. Now, in today's episode, we want to speak about Ahlul Bayt in Hadith and in history. So now that we've seen what the Qur'an has to say about Ahlul Bayt, we want to see if Hadith and historical references support the argument that the wives are excluded from the Ahlul Bayt or whether they are included. So. When you examine the Hadith literature, when you look at the historical evidence, you actually see that the evidence, the external evidence, and by external evidence we're talking about evidence that is outside of the Qur'an, you find that, in fact, the strongest evidence that we have that supports the argument of the exclusion of the wives from the verse of purification is actually found in the Ahadith. Now, the debate is essentially about the term Ahlul Bayt and what that term actually means and to whom does that term refer. And of course, this issue is debated by scholars by Sunni scholars, by Shia scholars, but I think that all Muslims would agree that the Prophet Rasulullah is the most knowledgeable about the Qur'an. And therefore, the Prophet's explanation of any particular verse or word in the Qur'an is going to trump all other opinions and interpretations. So, when we look at the ahadith of the Prophet, when we look at the historical records, how does the Prophet actually interpret the term Ahlul Bayt? And how does he use it? And to whom does he point to when he uses the expression, when he uses the term Ahlul Bayt? When you look at the ahadith, and we'll share uh, a few of them, inshallah, in this episode. When you look at the ahadith, you see that not only does the Prophet use this term to exclusively refer to the Holy Five, and by the Holy Five we mean the Prophet uh, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. Not only does he use it to refer to them exclusively, but he also makes it a point to exclude in some of the narrations, to exclude some of the wives of the Prophet. So we begin our discussion in this episode with Hadith al-Kisa. Hadith al-Kisa is one of the most famous prophetic traditions. In fact, the, the, just, just by the mere fact that, it, that the Hadith has a name highlights that it's a famous Hadith. The majority of the prophetic traditions don't have titles. They don't have names. This hadith is so well known that it was given a name. 
Hadith al Kisa, the Hadith of the Cloak. And this Hadith, in terms of its grading, it is a mutawatir hadith, meaning this hadith has been independently reported by so many companions that we know for sure that these words were uttered by the Prophet, that this incident took place. It's a mutawatir hadith, which gives us certainty that uh, this is actually a, uh, a, a true uh, event. It's something that actually happened just by the sheer number and how widely it was transmitted from generation to generation. So, of course, so there are many versions of Hadith al Kisa, but for the sake of brevity, I'll just mention one version of the narration. Now, this particular narration is found in Jami' al Tirmidhi, which is one of the sixth authentic hadith sources in the Sunni tradition. The narration is from An, an Umar ibn Abi Salama, Rabib al Nabi. So this narration is transmitted by Umar ibn Abi Salama. He's basically the son of Umm Salama. Umm Salama is the wife of the Prophet. So he reports this narration uh, and he probably heard it from his mother. قال لما نزلت هذه الآية على النبي صلى الله عليه وآله. He says that when this verse, when آية التطهير, when verse 33 of Surah Al-Ahzab was revealed, في بيت أم سلمة, and this آية was revealed, when it was revealed in the home of Um Salama, his own mother, دعا فاطمة وحسنا وحسينا فجللهم بكساء. The Prophet, he called upon Fatima, Hassan, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, and he spread a cloak over them. And Ali was positioned behind the Prophet. The Prophet spread a cloak over all of them, over Ali, Fatima. Hassan and Hussein. When the cloak was covering these five, the narration says from Umar ibn Abi Salama, قال اللهم هؤلاء أهل بيتي. O oh Allah, these are my Ahlul Bayt. And then the Prophet makes the dua, فأذهب عنهم الرجس. So remove any impurity from them. وَطَهِرْهُمْ تَطْهِيرًا And thoroughly purify them. This incident takes place in the home of Umm Salama, one of the most noble and righteous wives of the Prophet. قَالَتْ أُمُّ سَلَمَ Umm Salama then says, she, it seems that she approaches the Prophet while he is under the cloak with Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein, and she says, وَأَنَا مَعَهُمْ يَا نَبِيَ اللَّهِ Am I one of them? Am I a member of the Ahlul Bayt? قَالَ أَنْتِ عَلَى مَكَانِكِ وَأَنْتِ عَلَى خَيْرِ The Prophet basically says to her, remain in your place, meaning don't come underneath, stay where you are, and you are upon goodness. You are upon goodness. So here, very clearly, the Prophet ﷺ prohibits Umm Salama from coming underneath the cloak. So from this hadith, we see that the Prophet ﷺ restricts the meaning of Ahlul Bayt to these five personalities, himself, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and he doesn't allow Umm Salama to join them underneath the cloak. Not only does he not allow her, he explicitly says that remain where you are. You are upon goodness. He doesn't say to her that, yes, you are among Ahlul Bayt, but I just want to, I want to highlight the virtue of these five. There is no statement issued by the Prophet 
that would give any indication that Um Salama is among the members of the Ahlul Bayt. Now, when you look at Hadithul Kisa, what's interesting is that there are numerous versions of this narration. We have multiple uh, versions of this riwayah. We have, for example, Hadithul Kisa narrated by Aisha, narrated by Zainab, uh, who requested again to join the Holy Five under the cloak, and they were also turned away. Now, someone may wonder, you know, why is it that we have some narrations where it was in the house of Aisha? Another narration is, says that the the incident of the cloak took place in the house of Um Salama. Is this a contradiction? Now, what the way that our scholars have resolved this, they say that the variance in the narrations likely indicates that this incident, this action happened several times in the homes of different wives. So this incident took place in the house of Um Salama, probably in the house of Aisha, in the house of others. It happened multiple times. And it seems that the Prophet did this. He covered them under the cloak in, at, at multiple times in different places to emphasize the status, the supreme, the lofty status of Ahlul Bayt and to affirm more than once that his wives are excluded. So if someone says that, oh, maybe this is just Um Salama, it happened, Um Salama was excluded, Aisha was excluded, and perhaps others were. So the Prophet ﷺ performed this action of covering the Holy Five on a number of occasions to remove any doubt as to who are the reference of uh, the, uh, who is being referred to uh, with the term Ahlul Bayt. Now, we also have an interesting narration from one of the senior companions of the Prophet. You know, one of the, the beliefs or one of the, uh, the principles in the Sunni tradition is that if you follow any companion of the Prophet, this, that is a valid path. You know, you know, there's a narration that is considered authentic by our Sunni brothers and sisters where they say that allegedly the Prophet said, my uh, ashabi can nujum, that my companions are like the stars. Whichever one you follow, you will be guided. Now, Zayd ibn Arqam is a senior companion of the Prophet. And he actually expresses an opinion on this issue that actually supports the exclusion of the Prophet's wives. Meaning that his opinion substantiates the view that the wives are not included in the term Ahlul Bayt. And what makes Zayd ibn Arqam's view important is that, of course, this is an argument that can be used against our Sunni brothers and sisters that say, look, it's not just the Shias who say that uh, the wives are excluded. One of the most senior companions of the Prophet also argues the same. And in fact, his view is consistent with the Holy Qur'an because the Qur'an makes it very clear that the wives are not tied to the Prophet essentially, meaning their connection to the Prophet is an accidental connection, meaning that they have the option of leaving. They're not permanently bound and tied to the Prophet. The Prophet has the option of divorcing them. And in fact, Allah threatens some of them with divorce. So there is the possibility of them being removed from the Prophet. That tie, that connection to the Prophet can potentially be uh, severed. So the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, bi isnadihi an Yazid ibn Hayyan, an Zayd, Yazid ibn Hayyan, he reports from Zayd ibn Arqam, قال, قال Rasulullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, أَلَا إِنِّ تَارِكٌ فِيكُمْ ثِقْلَيْنِ 
Zayd ibn Arqam says that the Prophet said, I am leaving to you two weighty things. Ahaduhuma kitabullah azza wa jal. The first of them is the book of Allah. Wahua huwa hablullah man attaba'ahu kana ala al huda. The Quran is the first of the weighty things. It is the book of Allah. It is the rope, the rope of God. Whoever follows it is upon guidance. وَمَنْ تَرَكَهُ كَانَ عَلَىٰ ضلالة. And whoever abandons the Qur'an, they are in a state of deviation. فَقُلْنَا مَنْ أَهْلُ بَيْتِهِ نِسَاؤُهُ So then, the audience of Zayd ibn Arqam, probably other Sahaba, other Tabi'een, they ask him, who are the Ahlul Bayt? Is it his women folk, his wives? And this is where you see that Zayd ibn Arqam, he actually says, he gives an emphatic no. He says, no, by God. He says, no, no way, by God, they are not. He says, a woman can be with a man for a period of time, when he divorces her and she returns to her father and people. Meaning that when she's married, yes, linguistically she is a part of his household. But when she divorces, if, if she's divorced, she returns to her family. She's no longer associated and connected to the Prophet. So Ahlul Bayt refer to individuals who are permanently tied to the Prophet. Meaning that it is not possible to separate them from the Prophet. And since the wives can be separated, that association, that link with the Prophet can be severed through divorce, they are not referenced in Ayatul Tatir. They are not his Ahlul Bayt. And then he says, the Ahlul Bayt are his kin from whom charity is prohibited after his passing. Now here, he makes a mistake. We believe that he was correct in his exclusion of the Prophet's wives, but he, he made Ahlul Bayt too inclusive because he started to he included, you know, the entire, the Prophet's, all of his Prophet's kin, the entire, you know, Bani Hashim. And, and then he, he explains that these are the ones upon whom Sadaqa is prohibited. Now, inshallah, in our next episode, we'll go through uh, some of the. Uh, the Sunni contentions, but in this episode, I just want to go through the ahadith and the historical uh, narrations. So we have Hadith al Kisa clearly excluded the wives of the Prophet from the term Ahlul Bayt. Zayd ibn Arqam, a prominent companion of the Prophet, in his view, they are also excluded. Number three, we have another highly reliable hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, after the revelation of a verse in Surah Taha where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet وأمر, وأمر أهلك بالصلاة والصبر عليها, and command your family to Pray and be persistent. After the revelation of this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially enjoining his family towards prayer. The Prophet sallallahu would go to the house of Ali and Fatima at dawn. And he would recite ayatul tathir outside of the house of Ali and Fatima. This is mentioned, this narration is mentioned by Al-Hakim and Naysaburi and in his book Al-Mustadrak ala Sahihain, a very important book. And it's an important book because the individual he is known as Al-Hakim. So this is someone who has who is a leading expert on hadith, so much so that he's given this honorific title of Hakim, meaning that he's like a judge who decides what hadith is reliable and what hadith is not. He wrote this book, Al-Mustadrak, which is basically a supplement to 
Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And he wrote this book because according to him, if you follow the methodology, the authentication methodology of Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and uh, Muslim ibn Hajjaj al Naysaburi, if you follow their methodology, these ahadith are also sahih. So in this book, he collects all of the sahih narrations that are authentic according to the methodology of Bukhari and Muslim, but for whatever reason, they were not included in their hadith collections. This hadith is one of them. The hadith is from Anas ibn Malik. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله كان يمر بباب فاطمة ستة أشهر إذا خرج لصلاة الفجر. On the authority of Anas ibn Malik, that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله used to go to the door of Fatima for six months whenever he went for the dawn prayer, whenever he went for صلاة الفجر. And he would stand outside of their door, and of course Sahaba are there, they're and this is happening on a, on a daily basis. And he would stand out outside of the door of Fatima and Ali, and he would say, As-salatu ya ahl al-bayt. As-salatu ya ahl al-bayt. And he would repeat this. And then he would recite, Ayatu al-tatheer. Innama yuridu Allahu li yudhiba ankum al-ritsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahirakum tatheera. O ahl al-bayt, indeed. Only God only desires to remove all filth from you, O Ahlul Bayt, and to purify you with a thorough purification. To give you an idea of how authentic and how well established this hadith is in the collective memory of the early Muslims, you see that this particular hadith, in its different variances, and its different variations, is narrated by over 300 Sahaba. And of course, there is some variation, and the variation, the variation is seen in the length of time that the Prophet performed this action. Some of the companions say that he did this for 40 consecutive days. Others say, like Anas ibn Malik, six months, every morning the Prophet would do this. Some companions say nine months. Now this ikhtilaf, this variation in the narrations can be explained by the fact that different companions tracked the Prophet doing this for different lengths of time. So, you know, those maybe who were traveling, who weren't around, maybe when they started following the Prophet, they counted 40 days from when they followed him and they were praying Salatul Fajr with him. Others, six months. Others, nine months. The point being here is that the Prophet ﷺ recited Ayatul Tathir on a daily basis, on a number of occasions. He called them, As Salatu Ya Ahlul Bayt, the prayer, O Ahlul Bayt, recited Ayatul Tathir. And it seems that the Prophet did this to demonstrate who the Ahlul Bayt were. And the Prophet was very keen on showing his followers. Who is meant by the Ahlul Bayt? He didn't stand outside of the house of Umm Salam. He didn't stand outside of the house of Aisha because they all had their individual homes. They had their own living spaces, their own living quarters. The Prophet only stands in front of the house of Ali and Fatima. So there is no doubt that Ahlul Bayt referred to these people, these specific individuals exclusively. So that's with respect to the, the recitation of Ayatul Tathir at the doorstep of Ali and Fatima. And as I said, this is something that happened on a regular basis and it was witnessed and reported by 300 companions at least. And that is a staggering number. You will, other than Ghadir, uh, the hadith of Ghadir and maybe you know, a couple of other incidents, you're not going to find that many uh, companions reporting, independently reporting uh, an incident. Then you have the hadith of Mubahala. And of course, you know, we're approaching uh, the event of, of Mubahala. It's a very well-known event 
in the history of Islam where the Christians of Najran, and Najran was in uh, modern day Yemen, they belied the Prophet's message. Of course, they were invited, uh, the Prophet called them to Islam. They took the Prophet's letter very seriously. They sent a delegation of Christian scholars and priests and bishops to Medina and they met with the Prophet. The Prophet had a lengthy conversation with them and the focus of their discussion was the nature of Isa ibn Maryam. Of course, they ascribed divinity to him. The Prophet provided evidence that he was a human being, he was a prophet, a messenger of Allah, a servant of Allah, but they stubbornly rejected. And then they were challenged to Mubahala, where the two parties who are involved, they mutually, together, they invoke the wrath of Allah to descend upon the one who is not upon the truth. And it seems that Mubahala was a well-known practice even in the Christian tradition because it doesn't seem like the Prophet really has to explain the, the details of what a Mubahala entails. It seems that it was known and understood by the Christians of Najran. Now in this narration, we also find that the term Ahlul Bayt is used exclusively for the Holy Five. And this event is mentioned in elaborate detail. It's mentioned in a hadith, in a very lengthy hadith, meaning the hadith is not mentioned in elaborate detail, but the hadith is mentioned in a lengthy hadith where, uh, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, where Muawiyah, he asks Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, who is a very famous companion of the Prophet, he asks him, why he refrained from insulting Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the narration in Sahih Muslim reads as follows. An Amr ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So Amr is basically the son of this famous Sahabi. He narrates from his father. So this story was passed on to the son and the son is now mentioning what he heard from his father. He says that my father said to me, that one day Muawiyah, uh, Muawiyah basically asked, he commanded in fact, because he was the self-proclaimed Khalifa, Amara Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan Sa'da. So Amr says that Muawiyah commanded his father Sa'd to insult Ali ibn Abi Talib. And basically he asked him, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَسُبَّ أَبَا تُرَاب What prevents you from insulting Abu Turab? Subhanallah, brothers and sisters. Imagine that the one who is not cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's the outsider. He is the oddball. He is the anomaly, meaning it's very prevalent. Everyone is doing it. What's wrong with you? Why are you not participating in the slander and in the insults and the uh, the uh, in the slander of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is where Saad ibn Abi Waqqas he says, "أما ما ذكرت ثلاثا قال قالهن له رسول الله فلن أسب." Saad basically says that the reason why I don't insult Ali ibn Abi Talib is because whenever I remember three things that the Prophet said to him. And these three things are more beloved to me. To have even one of these merits and virtues is more beloved to me than having red camels. Now, red camels, you may wonder what is the value and the significance of red camels in the Arabian context at that time. A red camel was basically the equivalent of a luxury vehicle. So basically he's saying that if you were to offer me a fleet of luxury vehicles in exchange for one of these virtues that was given to Ali, I would favor 
even one of these virtues that was granted to him by the Prophet. So he goes, it's a very lengthy hadith, he mentions the, the day of Khaybar and after the failure of the first two to conquer Khaybar, the Prophet said, tomorrow I will give the standard to a man who loves God and his messenger and God and his messenger love him. Of course, this was a reference to Ali. And then the incident of uh, uh, where the Prophet says to Imam Ali that you are to me as Harun was to Musa, illa annahu la nabiyya ba'di. And the third merit that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas mentions as a reason why he does not curse Ali, he says, When the verse related to the Mubahala was revealed, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ دَعَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ عَلِيًّا وَفَاطِمًا وَحَسَنًا وَحُسَيْنًا when the Mubahala was agreed upon and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the Prophet, tell them, summon your sons and our sons, your women and our women, yourselves and ourselves. The Prophet only summons Ali, he only summons Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. And then when they arrive at the scene, when they are with him, فَقَالْ أَلَّهُمَّ هَاؤُلَاءِ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ هَاؤُلَاءِ أَهْلُ بَيْتِ O oh Allah, these are my Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet had many wives. If the wives were part of the Ahlul Bayt, why didn't he bring them? So this hadith again highlights who the Ahlul Bayt are and who is excluded. So Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, and by the way, even Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas recognizes that the incident of Mubahala is a fadila for Ali. And wh what category does Ali fall under? He's not of the sons. He's not of the women. So naturally, even Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas recognizes that Ali was the declared self of the Prophet on the day of Ghadir. It's a fadila. It's a great virtue for him. But the point here is that you see again in the in Hadith al-Mubahala, the Prophet identifies his Ahlul Bayt as none other than Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein exclusively. And then you have Hadith al-Thaqalain. Hadith al-Thaqalain, again, it's a very well-known Hadith, one of the most authentic traditions that we have. عن زيد بن أرقم عن رسول الله زيد بن أرقم reports that and this is in uh, al-Tirmidhi جامع al-Tirmidhi one of the six authentic books in the Sunni tradition the Prophet says إني تارك فيكم ما إن تمسكتم به لن تضلوا بعدي أحدهما أعظم من الآخر كتاب الله حبل ممدود من السماء إلى الأرض وعترتي أهل بيتي. From Zayd bin Arqam on the authority of the Prophet, he says, "I am leaving. I am leaving for you that which, if you hold on to, you shall never deviate after me. One is greater than the other. The Book of God, an extended rope between the heavens and the earth, and my progeny, my أهل البيت وعترتي أهل بيتي." And then the Prophet says, The part of the hadith that I want to I want you to pay attention to, that I want to bring to your attention, is the part where the Prophet says, They shall never separate until they return to me at the pool of Kawthar. The Prophet makes it very clear that Ahlul Bayt and Qur'an never separate. This part of the hadith excludes the wives. Now you may say, how? How does this part of the hadith exclude the wives of the Prophet? So the Prophet, again, he says Ahlul Bayt and Qur'an, they never separate. This essentially means 
that number one, this is an endorsement of their isma. They're infallible. Because if they commit sin, that means they've separated from the Qur'an. They've separated from the commands and the prohibitions of the Qur'an. And we know for certain that one of the wives of the Prophet went against a Qur'anic command. When Aisha fought against Ali ibn Abi Talib and she was at the head of a military movement, when she was leading an army against Ali ibn Abi Talib in Ma'arakat Jamal, she was committing a sin. In fact, all Muslims recognize that she committed a sin by doing that. She violated a clear Quranic injunction, which is what? وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ And remain in your homes. She committed a sin by fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib. Even in the Sunni tradition, Ali is considered, according to them, one of the rightly guided caliphs. So the one who f goes to war with a rightly guided caliph means what? That they're misguided. They've gone, they've gone against the Qur'an. And she explicitly went against that Qur'anic injunction in Surah Al-Ahzab. So she, by fighting Ali, she separated from the Qur'an. And the, but the Prophet said, Ahlul Bayt, never separate from the Qur'an. Furthermore, if that's not convincing enough, there's a very subtle point that Al-Allam Al-Amini gives. And he basically highlights that the wives of the Prophet never, in the, if you study the history of Islam, the wives of the Prophet never use Ayatul Tathir to prove their superiority. Allam al-Amini, this great Shi'i scholar who passed away several decades ago, I believe in the mid-1900s if I'm not mistaken, uh, he's, he famously wrote, uh, you know, he's, he's known for his magnum opus, uh, Kitab al-Ghadir, Fil uh, Kitabi wa sunnati wal adab 11 volumes. He spent 50 years studying Hadith al-Ghadir and where it's found and the sources and the interpretation. He says that the wives of the Prophet, and this is a man who spent the majority of his life studying this topic. He's an expert of the highest caliber. He says that the wives of the Prophet never use Ayatul Tathir to affirm and establish their merit and virtue. Even though some of them, meaning Aisha, even when she was in dire need of providing even a crumb of legitimacy for her rebellion against Ali, she doesn't cite Ayatul Tathir. There is no historical report that any of the wives of the Prophet referred to Ayatul Tathir as a verse that affirms their virtue and merit. In fact, Al-Bayhaqi, he says, he reports a narration, Su'ilat and Bayhaqi is a Sunni uh, scholar of hadith. He reports a tradition saying, Su'ilat Aisha, an Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says Aisha was asked about Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. And she said, Wama Aisaytu an Akula fi. What do you want me to say? So Aisha says, so she was asked about Ali. She said, what do you want me to say about Ali ibn Abi Talib? You know, he's the most beloved to the Prophet. And then she says, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ قَدْ جَمَعَ شَمْلَتَهُ عَلَىٰ عَلِيٍ وَفَاطِمَ وَالْحَسَنِ وَالْحُسَيْنِ She said, I had seen the Messenger of God gather his cloak around Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, and he said, هَأُولَاءِ أَهْلُ بَيْتِي So again, this is a reference to Hadith Al-Kisa. It seems like it happened, in, it seems that it happened in the house of Aisha too. She says, the Prophet said, These are my Ahlul Bayt. اللَّهُمَّ أَذْهِبْ عَنْهُمُ الرِّجْزِ وَطَاهِرْهُمْ تَطِيرْ O oh Allah, ward off all filth from them and purify them thoroughly. قِيلَ لَهَا 
So it was said to her, فَكَيْفَ سِرْتِ إِلَيْهِ If Ali is one of Ahlul Bayt, why did you revolt against him? She said, أَنَا نَادِمَ وَكَانَ ذَلِكَ قَدْرًا مَقْدُورًا She says, I am regretful of it, but it was a pre-ordained affair. Now at this moment, Aisha is being accused of revolting against Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why didn't she say that I took Tatir also? I, I fought against him because I'm also a member of Ahlul Bayt. Why are you taking Ali's side? So if the wives of the Prophet were included in the import of the verse, it would have been possible for Aisha to respond to the questioner and saying that she's also part of this group that God has purified. So why didn't she? She needed legitimacy. In the events leading up to the Battle of Jemen, she refers to herself as the mother of the believers, that's no doubt. But she never says that I am a member of the Ahlul Bayt. If she was, if she could have gotten away with it, then she would have said it, but she couldn't say it. She knew that she wasn't part of the Ahlul Bayt. And all the Muslims, also, it was clear to them that the wives are excluded from Ayatul Tatir. In fact, there is an even clearer testament within hadith sources from Umm Salama in reference to this verse where she makes it clear that Ahlul Bayt does not refer to her. An Amr al Hamdaniya. There was a woman by the name of Amr al Hamdaniya. Anna dakhalat ala Umm Salama. She entered into the presence of Umm Salama and she said, Ya Ummata, O oh my mother, meaning because she is the mother of the believers. Ala tukhbirini an hadha rajul. Can you tell me about this man, meaning Ali, alladhi qutila bayna adhurina fa muhibbun wa mubghidh? You know, a lot of people have been fighting about him. They've, some people have fought him. He has many lovers, many haters. Qalat laha Umm Salama. Atuhibbina? Umm Salama asks this woman, Do you love Ali? And the woman said, La uhibbuhu wa la ubghidhu. She says, I don't, hate, I don't love him and I don't hate him. Basically, she says, I'm neutral. Turidu Ali ibn Abi Talib, Faqalat laha Umm Salama. Umm Salama says to this woman, Anzala Allahu ta'ala innama yuridu Allah. That this verse, Ayatul Tatir, was revealed to the Prophet. And there was no one in the home when this verse was revealed except for Jibra'il, the Prophet, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, and me. There were seven in the house Jibra'il and the Holy Five, and I was the seventh of them. فَقُلْتُ So I said to the Prophet, فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَنَا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ Am I from أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So the Prophet said, أَنْتِ مِنْ صَالِحِ نِسَائِ You are among my righteous wives. And then she says, فَلَوْ كَانَ قَالَ نَعَمْ She says, if the Prophet had only said yes, that you are from my أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ كان أحب إلي مما تطلع عليه الشمس وتغرب. She said that if only he had said yes, it would have been dearer to me than everything upon which the sun rises and sets. And this is mentioned in شواهد التنزيل لقواعد التفضيل, written by a famous Sunni scholar. Now, we'll conclude with this. The wives of the Prophet never used Ayatul Tathir to establish their superiority or to affirm their merit and virtue. On the other hand, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have frequently used this verse to establish their unique position and their lofty status in the eyes of Allah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he uses Ayatul Tathir when he disputed with the companions about his being 
more worthy for the Khilafah. So when, especially when, when uh, they were in that council that Umar ibn al-Khattab established, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam uses this ayah to make the case for himself that the Khilafah, he's more worthy of the Khilafah. وَفِ احْتِجَاجِهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ عَلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الشُّورَى During the consultation, during the shura, after, the, uh, after Umar ibn al-Khattab was stabbed and he was on his deathbed, he appointed a six-man council where from among them they would choose the next caliph. Amir al-Mu'mineen makes the case for himself. قَالَ أُنْشِدُكُمْ بِاللَّهِ هَلْ فِيكُمْ أَحَدٌ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فِي آيَةِ التَّطْهِيرِ Is there anyone among you? I ask you by God, is there anyone among you for whom God revealed the verse of purification to his messenger such that he took a khaybari cloak, which was the kisa, and encompassed myself, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, then said, O oh my Lord, these are my Ahlul Bayt. So remove all filth from them and completely purify them. They answered, by God, no, there is no one else. There's no one else. So Ali uses ayat, the ayat al tatil to establish his merit. Fatima to Zahra uses it. Imam al Hassan in one of his sermons, he uses it. Imam al Hussein in his conversation with Marwan, Marwan ibn al Hakim, he uses it. Imam al Sajjad, if you look at Sahif al Sajjadiyya, it is, there are many passages in Sahif al Sajjadiyya where the Imam refers to himself, he refers to his forefathers as the addressees in Ayatul Tatir. Imam al Sadiq, Imam al Ridha. But we don't see the same with the wives of the Prophet. So if Ayatul Tatir included the wives of the Prophet, then how come throughout history it was never used to establish their superiority? Especially when Aisha was in dire need of legitimacy. You would, you would think that there would be many narrations. But even Aisha realized that that is not something, that that's something that was widely known, that the Ahlul Bayt... It does not refer to the wives and it refers exclusively to uh, the Prophet Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. With that, uh, we conclude, my dear brothers and sisters. Inshallah, in our next episode, as I promised, we'll go through uh, some of the main uh, Sunni rebuttals and refutations, the contentions that they've put forward. And uh, inshallah, uh, with the help of Allah, we will respond to those contentions uh, thank you so much for tuning in uh, once again and i look forward to having you join me on future episodes of the life of prophet muhammad wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad so thank you for the uh, really interesting lecture sheikh and so uh, we talked about uh, the Ahl, the call to prayer the Prophet would make for the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, do we have a timeline of when that verse of Ayatul Tathir was revealed and when that uh, verse commanding the Prophet to uh, enjoin his family to prayer happened? So that verse, so Ayatul Tathir, as I said, it was probably revealed during the middle to the end of the Medani period. I don't know exactly when, it's hard to say when it was uh, revealed, but it was definitely uh, revealed sometime in the middle or the end of the Medani period. And the verse is obviously, Ayatul Tatir is in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33. So that verse was revealed before the ayah, which is in Surah Baha, the, and the ayah, I believe it's, I want to say that it's 130, 132 or 123. Let me just quickly look up the verse. So the verse that commands the Prophet to enjoin his family 
to prayer is verse 132 of Surah Taha. وَأَمُرْ أَهْلَكَ And enjoin prayer upon your family and be steadfast, meaning be uh, persistent. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ understood this verse to refer to the Ahlul Bayt. Now, of course, it's not that the Prophet needs to, you know, in, enjoin the Prophet to pray in the sense that if he like, it's not that they're not praying and he has to encourage them or motivate them to pray. But this was a way for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, to convey to the Prophet that you have to make it uh, immensely clear to your Ummah who the Ahlul Bayt are, and this is uh, an actionable way of doing that. So this ayah was revealed after uh, the revelation of uh, Ayatul Tatir. So you're looking middle to the late uh, Medini period. Probably late Medini. Uh, 